is kind of give you a quick overview, but in your force concept model notes, we're basically each one of these has got to be its own thing with stuff underneath it. So yesterday we started this, I'm going to kind of reiterate it and, and kind of go a little quickly through the beginning part since we started it yesterday. And then we're going to just kind of do example after example after example. Now, I want to kind of be clear that although this is a framework, there's a set of steps under each one. So the first one says to evaluate whether it's a first law or second law problem. So what do I mean by that? Sorry, did you guys get a chance to write all that down? Are you still writing it down? I mean, I'm going to say each one of those things again. Step two is about drawing a free body diagram. So I want to remind us that there are other things here. These next couple of things are not about the free body diagram. They are things that are about what to do. Resolve off axis forces. Last, apply Newton's law in each dimension. What I want to do is kind of break this one up into two sides because we're going to do a bunch of free body diagrams in the beginning just to kind of get an idea for how to do them. This part seems like it's just about drawing a picture, but this is the part where you really evaluate what's happening. And I, I, I can't impress upon you enough that if you can't get the picture right, you won't be able to get the problems right. If that's, that's the most important part. So drawing a free body diagram has several aspects to it, but one of them is going through a list of, of forces. And this is not an exhaustive list. There's going to be more forces that we're going to be bringing up over the course of the year, but I'm going to give you a basic outline of the kinds of forces you'll have to deal with. But at the same time, we're going to talk about different examples. So the left side of this page, I'm going to be drawing free body diagrams. The right side, I'm going to be going through the steps and making some notes. So although at the same time that I'm going through the steps, we're going to see different examples some from the most ridiculous and boring to more and more complicated examples. So drawing a free body diagram, the first thing is that each object with mass is represented by a, a point. So we're only dealing with the single body problem, which means we're only going to have one dot for ours. But in a couple of weeks, we'll be doing a multi-body problem, so you might have three or four. And I'm saying each object with mass, I know you're probably what you're thinking, well, there's stuff that's, everything's got mass. Well, there's special things in physics. We'll say the pulley is massless, or we'll say the string that connects two things is massless. What we really mean is that it has a really small mass compared to the other things in the problem and therefore it doesn't affect the problem very much. So the word mass or massless is really about comparatively, we don't worry about this thing because it's really small or doesn't have much impact on the problem. But when they say this object has mass M or this object has mass 60 grams, that object needs a dot. So any object in your problem that you're being asked to deal with, you're probably gonna make a dot for it. The second thing is, is you're gonna draw arrows representing each force. They start at the center, and they're drawn in the direction of the force. They should be drawn to scale. Now, 
raise your hand if you don't know what I mean when I say the phrase drawn to scale. Good. Okay. You create the scale. So you're deciding how big the arrows are supposed to be. But ultimately, the, the guide or what you should be thinking about is that if your system is balanced, there should be equal amounts of things pulling up versus pulling down, pulling left versus pulling right. If the object is accelerating, then you should see a clear unbalance in the direction the object is accelerating. But you start by just picking a size for your first arrow and making sure the rest of them are of a relative size that makes sense. I know that sounds a little weird, but you're choosing the scale, but if you know a force is half the size of another force, it should be drawn to look half the size of the other force. We're gonna do some examples so you'll kind of get the idea of what I mean. Now, step three is where we're gonna spend a lot more time. You're gonna go through all the possible forces. And ask whether they each apply in this circumstance. There are three categories of forces. There are the conservative forces, or fundamental forces. I think I talked about those yesterday. Did I give you a brief overview of them, I hope? Uh, gravitational, electroweak, strong nuclear. In this class, we just have gravity, which we will call weight. There are others, and you need to know all three of them, and you need to know them in order from weakest to strongest, but for everything we're gonna do in this class, gravity is the only one you have to worry about. Then we have contact forces. Although there are a lot of different contact forces, we're gonna focus on only two of them. Normal forces. And tension forces. I'm gonna represent normal forces with the capital N and tension forces with the capital T. Normal forces are pushing forces, and they are perpendicular. Tension forces require like a string or a cord, rope. There has to be something that connects to the object that can pull in the direction of the tension. And last, resistive forces. These are things like friction, which I'll use a lowercase f for. It's the only lowercase symbol I will use to describe a force. And drag, or air resistance. Um, we're going to talk more about friction, but friction generally prevents one surface from sliding past another. That's what friction forces do. Now, I'm going to leave this up here for us to go through, and we're going to go through a bunch of examples. So, again, these are our three categories of forces. There's conservative forces, contact forces, and resistive forces. Unless you are told otherwise, there won't be any air resistance. And so for today, we won't have air resistance as one of our forces. All of the other ones our potential forces for today's examples. We're gonna do a bunch of examples, but we're only gonna be doing examples to draw free body diagrams. I would encourage you to have a, a, a ruler out to draw these. And although not super necessary, a protractor might not be a bad idea either in the future.
So we're going to start with example number one. And the first example is the book on my desk. I want to draw a free body diagram that indicates the forces that are acting on the book. Now we're going to go through our, our full series of steps, of which we have a bunch now. So I'm going to ask you, the book, is it, do you, I mean, you're, you're looking at it right now. Do you think we're going to use the first law to study the book or the second law to study the book? Is the book accelerating or is it not accelerating? So if it's not accelerating, I'm going to list this as a first law problem. And what I'll usually do is somewhere at the very beginning, remind myself this is a first law problem by writing the, the mathematical for, you know, formula for the first law. So this is me telling myself and telling the test grader I'm treating this as a first law problem. Now, the second thing I want to do is draw a free body diagram. Now, in order to draw a free body diagram, I know there's only one object, it's the book. So I'm going to draw a dot to represent the book. And I'm going to draw arrows moving away from that dot to indicate each of the forces acting on my object. I'm going to try and draw them to scale. And I'm going to try and be careful about the way in which I draw them. Now, in drawing my picture, I'm going to go through my set of forces and ask myself, which of these forces do I think is acting on the object? So, starting with the beginning, is there a fundamental force acting on the object? The answer to this question is always going to be yes. Be the first one to say it. And you are setting the scale of your picture by drawing that first arrow in. I'm saying you're setting the scale because you can count on every object to have a weight. And so this kind of dictates the size of the picture you're going to draw. So I'm drawing a clear arrow downwards, indicating the weight of the book. Now, I'm going to be adding stuff a little at a time so that you can be adding things in here to your set of steps. Of all of these forces, several of them have expressions that you need to know about. The first one is weight. Weight is the product of the mass of an object times g, the acceleration of gravity. So usually I'll write mg next to weight. Sometimes I'll put it right in the problem. I'll just put right here, indicating that I'm going to use mg for the weight of this object. Perhaps they've told me that the object is mass m1 so i'll put m1g just to remind me that this picture is about mass one weight's the only one that we have an automatic substitution for its function now after we've dealt with the fundamental force we're going to go through a list of the conservative forces and ask if any of the conservative forces are acting on the object be aware you can have multiple tensions multiple normal forces any surface in contact with the object imparts a force. Any cable or string touching the object imparts a force. So as we start listing forces, look at the number of surfaces that are in contact with your object. Now, this one's stupid simple. Is the object in contact with any surface? Yeah, it's touching the table, right? And normal forces, which are forces from surfaces, have to be perpendicular to the surface in contact. Being very careful about this, you will make mistakes on this. Normal forces aren't upwards. Normal forces are perpendicular to the surface in contact. So I'm going to draw a normal force in. And to draw it, I'm going to draw an arrow upwards. And I think the table is supporting the book. So I'm going to draw the arrow to be the same size as the weight. And I'll label it with just a capital N to indicate that it is the normal force. Now, are there any other surfaces in contact with the book? I don't think so. And I know you're asking, well, how could there be? What if you're sitting on the edge of something that was at a corner? You could have two surfaces acting on it. What if I was pushing down on the book with my hand? Then I would be another force acting on the book. There's plenty of other ways you can have other surfaces acting on an object. So this case, 
There's not. Now, moving on, are there any cables or strings attached to the object? Doesn't appear to be, so I'm not gonna put any tension forces. Now, here's the thing, friction. Friction's a hard one because there's several different types of friction. There's friction that holds things in place, and then there's frictions that act on objects that are sliding. Do you think friction is holding the book in place? Like, is there something trying to move the book and friction's trying to keep it in place? I don't think so. So I don't think I'm gonna put a frictional force here. It doesn't seem like it's necessary. And unless you're told differently, there's no air resistance in the problem. I don't think there's air resistance in this problem. So we have made it through to the bottom of our list. We have asked ourselves about all of the forces acting on the object. This is our complete free body diagram. A free body diagram is supposed to be a series of arrows that describe the forces acting on an object. All right? Any questions about this? Now, let's put this away for a minute. Because there's a little more to do. with the free body diagram. So this next one says to apply coordinate system. You fully get to decide how you wanna break up your problem. But I would like to give you some points of information that will help you here. When you apply a coordinate system, we're talking about applying the positive X, negative X, positive Y, and negative Y directions. You're gonna superimpose a coordinate system. This is how you solve the problem. Now, you're gonna have tests that are gonna say, uh, you know, draw a free body diagram and then they'll usually add to it, you know, solve the problem using your free body diagram. But if you have to add anything to your free body diagram, do it separately. So this is the end. When you've done this, you've drawn your free body diagram. What we're doing next is using our free body diagram to solve a problem. And what you do is apply a coordinate system. There are two guiding rules for applying a coordinate system. When possible, always point a positive direction in the direction of the acceleration. When possible, you will always point a positive direction, either positive Y or positive X, in the direction of the acceleration. If you can't do that, then use one that's lined up with as many forces as possible. So these are priorities. This is your first priority. If you have to choose between them, always choose one. If your object is accelerating, point a positive direction in the direction of the acceleration. Otherwise, the problem will be impossible for you to solve with the math that you have. Now, if you don't have to do that, then do number two. Number two makes your life easier. So if this object were accelerating, we would have to worry about this choice. But our object isn't accelerating, we do not have to worry about this choice. So just choose a coordinate system that's useful. I'm gonna choose one that's super useful. I'm gonna superimpose a coordinate system on top of my problem, and I'm gonna label it with positive x, positive y, negative x, negative y. We are superimposing a coordinate system on top of our diagram. Now, we don't have any off axis forces. Do you notice that all of our forces point along one of our axes? This problem doesn't require us to do any resolving of forces. So I'm gonna leave that, that one out to our next example. There are two dimensions here. There's an X dimension and a Y dimension. And this is the law we chose to use for this problem. So you take that law 
and you break it up into the net force in the x direction, which must equal zero, because both must equal zero. This is a Newton's first law problem. Take your law and break it up into the x direction and the y direction. and apply it. Now, this part that I'm gonna talk about here, I wanna be really, really direct with you. This is instructions. So let me pick one of these, I'll put the X here. Sum means to add up all forces in the x direction that symbol taking into account their direction and set them equal to zero. So add up all the forces in the x direction, taking into account their direction and set them equal to zero. Taking into account their direction for us means plus or minus. Should you make it positive or should you make it negative? This particular problem is stupid simple. There's only two forces and there are none in the X direction. So there's nothing to write here. There are two in the Y direction. There's a normal force upwards. So positive N and there's weight downwards minus weight. And I set it equal to zero. Now, I know what you're thinking. This is stupid, simple, Mr. Shelton. Why are you making such a big deal about this? Uh, this is a book resting on a table. You get that this is just showing you the, the steps, right? That they're not gonna be like this. That you'll have to do all the things that are here. And I'm trying to make the first one stupid, simple so we can walk through the procedure. We're gonna do another one right away. We're gonna go through all these steps but I want you to be really clear. I've done this for a long time. This set of steps, all it can ever do is produce an equation. At the end of every force problem, the force concept model gives you equations. After this, the problem has to be done. None of this solves the problem. This gives you a set of custom equations that are unique to every situation that could be used to solve the problem. Newton's laws don't solve the problem. They give you a framework where maybe you can use something you create from them to solve a problem. This is a different kind of thinking. There's no fixed equation. The only fixed equations are things like MG. That'll be fixed. But this part creates something new every time. We're gonna do an example right now where we're gonna create something new. So I wanna start fresh with a brand new situation. And let's see. I'm gonna leave all this here so I can bring this to our new situation every time I need one. We're applying a coordinate system. So here's our new situation. Uh, does somebody have a calculator I can borrow? So our calculator, just a box, right? That was placed on the surface of a book. But then the whole thing was tipped to the side like that. So the book was opened in angle theta and the calculator has a mass M. And I was watching closely. If you were watching closely, would you be able to agree with me that the calculator was stationary relative to the book? 
So I think we're dealing with a net force equals zero problem here. We want to draw a free body diagram that describes the calculator. So I think I've done enough work for the day. Put our little picture over there. I will do the next step. I will draw a dot indicating the, the calculator and you will do the rest. You have a series of steps. I will put the steps out there so you can walk through them, but you're gonna do the rest. I'm gonna judge your work. All right, so the first thing you gotta do is go through this list and decide what forces you should draw. Being careful to pay attention to detail and size of each of the forces. So begin. Like I said, thoughtful. I mean, I was watching the eyes glass over. You understand why I had to get through the whole list of things first. But now when we're looking at examples, you've got to be thoughtful. So I'm thinking we're going to draw a downward arrow first. It's setting the scale for the whole thing. And I'm going to label this weight. Now I want to draw the normal force. I'm looking at my picture here. You know, I, I set an arbitrary angle. But the normal force has to be perpendicular to that surface. Now you'll notice I didn't draw the normal force as long as the weight. That's not accidental. I think there's something else acting on the book. I don't see any strings, I'm sorry, not the book, acting on the calculator. I don't see any strings attached to the calculator, but I think I chose the calculator because it has those sticky feet on it. So what do you think's keeping the calculator from sliding down the book? I think friction. So I'm gonna draw something that indicates the frictional force. Remember I said I was gonna add stuff to this? I'm gonna add stuff to the frictional force. Frictional force prevents one surface from sliding past another. Friction only exists if there's a normal force. It's caused by contact with a surface. And friction is parallel to the surface. So if friction is always caused by a normal force and normal forces are perpendicular to the surface and friction is always parallel to the surface, friction has to be perpendicular to the normal force. Now I'm trying to draw a certain amount of balance. I know that the net force equals zero. So for every left, I want there to be a right, and for every down, I want there to be up. I want the same amount of things pulling up as pulling down, and I want the same amount pulling left as pulling right. I'm doing my best to try and make that happen. You're supposed to try your best, and that's one reason you have a protractor. You can make sure things that are supposed to be perpendicular to each other are actually perpendicular, perpendicular to each other in your diagram. So these two are supposed to be at a right angle, I would ensure that they are. You can do that with a, with a protractor. But I don't want you to spend hours on a free body diagram, minutes. Now, here's where it's going to get a little weird. This, I think, is an exhaustive list. We have found all the forces that are acting on the calculator. There's no air resistance. There's no cables pulling on the calculator. This is it. So our next job is to apply a coordinate system. Again, sounds easy. Let's talk about applying that coordinate system. So let me get the rule. There you go, rules for applying a coordinate system. Now, our system's not accelerating. 
So our next rule, use one that's lined up with as many forces as possible. If it were me, in order to make this as easy as possible and to follow those priorities, I would probably set this as the X direction and this as the Y direction as they are supposed to be perpendicular to each other. I want to follow my priorities and priority one is to line it up in the direction of the acceleration. Priority two is to line it up in the direction of as many forces as possible. Remember, in the next step, any force that's not lined up with X or Y, you have to do trig on it. So we could line this up with the weight, but then we'd have to break up the friction and the normal force into components. If we line it up this way, we only have to break up the weight into components. Of course, if we line it up this way, you have to figure out where theta goes. That's a whole nother thing that we'll do a different day, but it goes there. All right, let's do another example. The only thing that works here is to do more and more examples. So I have a new example. It's gonna involve the book again. list for this one. My arm is what's called an applied force. It doesn't fit the category of normal or tension. It's a force generally given to you in the problem and given to you at a specific angle and intent. So for this particular one, the way this would look in an example was here's my wall and I have my book and you'd be told there is an applied force on the book. At an angle of theta with the vertical. And the book slides up the wall at a constant velocity. Applied forces, usually I will symbolize with a capital F and an A next to it to say this force was given to us in the problem as something we have to use. And generally, just listed as a contact force. So I want you to draw all the forces acting in the system. Remember, forces originate on the dot and are drawn away from the dot. So this arrow that's in here that's yellow is not drawn correctly for your free body diagram. If you're gonna make the book, you know, your, your mass, you'll have to take this arrow and move it to whatever the dot is so that it appears to come from the center of the object. But this is what was pictured on the wall. When I was, this is what I did, right? By pushing on the book and moving it up the wall. So this is what it looked like. I'll leave this up here for you. Draw your free body diagram for this circumstance. So let's start at the beginning. Uh, conservative force, would you agree that there's weight acting on the book? So I'm gonna draw that one in. Um, I don't think there's any trouble in making sure that the, the low hanging fruit is taken. Uh, there is an applied force acting on the book. And I know that you're wondering why am I making it so big? Well, I need the, I know in the future, I'm thinking I have to have balance. And doesn't my upward force from me have to support the book? So I'm trying to draw it that way. So this is my applied force. Is the force, I'm sorry, is the book in contact with any surface? Yeah, the wall. 
So I need to draw another force indicating it was in contact with the wall. And I need to ensure that that force looks like it's pushing enough to keep the book from going through the wall, right? Left to right balance. But the normal force has to be away from the wall and perpendicular. Um, do you think there's any frictional forces acting on the system? I'm pretty sure, yeah. So I'd probably have to draw another force. That'd have to be downwards. Friction is trying to prevent the buck from sliding up the wall. So I think friction's gotta be downwards. This would describe what we just saw with me trying to push the book up the wall. All right, so let's start here with evaluating whether it's a first or a second law problem. I'll remind you that you are looking for something. First law problems are constant velocity or stationary. So if you have constant velocity or a stationary problem, you're gonna apply Newton's first law, which means yesterday we talked about it. Newton's first law looks like this, although that doesn't tell you very much. This is the mathematical relationship that goes with Newton's law. And I wanna explain more about it, but please be careful. It's not an equation in a general sense, it's something else. Second law problems are ones where there's an acceleration. But this is also the default. Meaning if you don't know whether it's a first or a second law problem, like they don't tell you or don't give you enough information, then you have to assume it's a second law problem until you can prove it's a first law problem. One is not easier than the other. The distinction is that in one, there's an acceleration and the forces are unbalanced. And in one, there's no acceleration and the forces are balanced. This, balanced. And in this one, unbalanced. This is what we covered yesterday, so I'm kind of going fast through it. But again, this is step one try and figure out whether you're dealing with a first law problem or a second law problem. Step two is the longer step. So can I go on to step two now?